Welcome back to Spoonful of Sugar. Today, we're excited to have MS4 Anisha Reddy back with us to host an episode on biliary and pancreatic disorders. Hope you enjoy. Hey, future doctors. Thanks for tuning in to Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Anisha Reddy. I'm an MS4 at Drexel College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. I'm back again today to discuss an important topic commonly tested on boards and seen on the internal medicine and surgery shelf exams. We will be talking about the biliary pancreatic diseases today. I will review the pathophysiology of each biliary disease and later review the diagnosis and treatment options. This podcast will be delivered in a Q&A format, so please try and answer along. All right, let's get started. Let's talk about diseases of the gallbladder and the biliary tract. Here's a vignette. A 43-year-old female presents with the chief complaint of recurrent right upper quadrant pain. She reports a 40-minute episode of abdominal pain after eating meals, especially after eating fried chicken and burgers. She denies fevers or chills, and her episodes always resolve. Her past medical history includes hyperlipidemia, morbid obesity, and PCOS. A right upper quadrant ultrasound is ordered, which shows gallstones without any wall thickening. What's the diagnosis? So the answer would be cholelithiasis, which is stones in the gallbladder. Essentially, the gallstone obstructs bile flow to the cystic duct. When the gallbladder contracts, the stone is blocking the cystic duct, causing recurrent bouts of pain. What are the different types of gallstones? So first you have cholesterol stones, which are the most common type of stones. These stones can be yellow to green in appearance. And the pathophysiology of cholesterol stones is bile gets supersaturated with cholesterol products, which precipitates cholesterol gallstones. What are the risk factors for cholesterol stones? The mnemonic you probably heard before is four Fs. So that would be fat, female, 40, fertile. And the reason why fertile women are more prone to gallstones is because they have increased estrogen which increases cholesterol secretion and then they would have increased progesterone which slows the emptying of the gallbladder and women who are pregnant are more susceptible to things like cholestasis. Other risk factors for cholesterol gallstone formation would be Crohn's disease, ileal resection, and cystic fibrosis. The reason is Crohn's disease affects the terminal ileum and the inflamed, diseased ileum fails to reabsorb bile salts. As a result, cholesterol builds up and gallstones form. And a similar type mechanism happens with ileal resection and cystic fibrosis. Another category of gallstone formation would be black pigmented stones. What causes black gallstones? The answer would be hemolysis, so things like sickle cell anemia, Hereditary spirocytosis and mechanical heart valves can cause black gallstones. Just think about your main causes of hemolysis. Additionally, there are another category of gallstones, which would be your brown stones. They are found in the bile ducts and associated with biliary tract infections. Now that we talked about the formation of gallstones, let's continue to talk about cholelithiasis. So what are some clinical features of cholelithiasis? Most cases are asymptomatic, and biliary colic is the cardinal symptom of gallstones. It's due to the temporary obstruction of the cystic duct by a gallstone. Pain occurs in the gallbladder as it contracts against this obstruction. Pain is usually located in the right upper quadrant and epigastric area, and it's referred pain of the right subscapular pain of biliary colic. How do you diagnose cholelithiasis? So the first line would be right upper quadrant ultrasound, It's good at visualizing if there's any gallstones in the gallbladder. You can also use CT, abdomen, pelvis. How do you treat cholelithiasis? So first line supportive care. You can use NSAIDs for pain control, diet modifications, avoiding fatty foods that trigger biliary colic, and rehydration. Patients can undergo elective cholecystectomy and indications would be recurrent bouts of cholelithiasis if patients are at risk for cholangiocarcinoma, if they have a porcelain gallbladder, or they have gallstone pancreatitis. Second line treatment for cholelithiasis 
would be ursodial. Usually, indications would be in patients unwilling or contraindicated to undergo cholecystectomy. The ursodial can be used as prophylaxis, or the mechanism is to dissolve the gallstones. All right, now that we talked about cholelithiasis, let's move on to our next vignette. We have a 50-year-old male with a BMI of 35, presents to the emergency room for pain in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. He reports that he has had similar pain on and off for the past few weeks, but this time the pain has persisted for over four hours. He associates with nausea, vomiting, and loss of appetite. On physical exam, he has right upper quadrant pain and inspiratory arrest with deep palpation of the area. An ultrasound of that area reveals distended gallbladder with thickened gallbladder wall and gallstones. What is the diagnosis? So the diagnosis would be acute cholecystitis. What is acute cholecystitis? That's obstruction of the cystic duct. It induces acute inflammation of the gallbladder wall. And one thing that I want to point out is, let's compare this to cholelithiasis, our previous vignette. In cholelithiasis, you're going to have intermittent pain, and that pain, the biliary colic type symptoms, doesn't last more than four to six hours. Most of the episodes resolve within one or two hours. But in acute cholecystitis, if you see constant pain, that persisted over four to six hours, that's more of a clue for acute cholecystitis. So you have two different types of acute cholecystitis. You have the calculus cholecystitis and the, the acalculus cholecystitis. Do you know the difference between the two? So with calculus cholecystitis, you, the etiology is gallstone impaction, resulting in inflammation that's more common. Um, approximately 10% of patients with gallstones develop acute cholecystitis. You can also have acalculus cholecystitis. Etiology is usually gallbladder stasis, hypoperfusion, infections seen in patients with sepsis. Think about acalculus cholecystitis in severely ill patients, like septic patients in the ICU, and it's associated with a high mortality rate. What bacteria can be the infectious etiology for the cholecystitis? Think about E. coli, Enterobacter, Enterococcus, Klebsiella. What are the clinical features of acute cholecystitis? That would be persistent pain in the right upper quadrant or epigastric area that radiates to the right shoulder or scapula. You might see nausea, vomiting, lack of appetite, some of the signs would be right upper quadrant tenderness. A key sign that's associated with acute cholecystitis would be the Murphy sign. It's inspiratory arrest during deep palpation of the right upper quadrant. It's not present in all cases. However, it's an important physical exam to do if you're suspecting acute cholecystitis. You might also see low-grade fever, leukocytosis. What would be the lab findings? You would see increased or normal alkaline phosphatase, increased or normal bilirubin, or increased or normal white blood cell count. So diagnosis of acute cholecystitis is best done with the right upper quadrant ultrasound. It has high sensitivity and specificity. Ultrasound findings include thickened gallbladder wall, pericholecystic fluid, distended gallbladder, and presence of stones or biliary sludge. Additionally, CT scan of the abdomen can be used. You might do it with contrast. Another type of scan would be a radionuclide scan, also known as the HIDA scan, which can be used when ultrasound is inconclusive. During a HIDA scan, tiny amount of radioactive dye is injected into your veins, and if no radioactive tracer can be seen in your gallbladder four hours after injection, then acute cholecystitis is confirmed. So what is the treatment of acute cholecystitis? You give the patient IV fluids, bowel rest by keeping the patient's NPO, IV antibiotics, pain control, correct any electrolyte abnormalities. Then consider surgery. Cholecystectomy is preferred within 24 to 48 hours. 
and in patients with a calculus cholecystitis who are too critically ill for surgery, treatment can be performing percutaneous drainage of the gallbladder with a cholecystostomy. All right, next vignette. So we have 52-year-old female with a past medical history of hyperlipidemia, obesity, diabetes, and cholelithiasis presents to the ED for fever and abdominal pain. On exam, she is febrile, tachycardic, and has scleral icterus. She is tender to palpation in the right upper quadrant. She is alert and oriented with a normal mental status. Labs reveal elevated alkaline phosphatase and elevated white blood cell count. A right upper quadrant ultrasound shows intrahepatic biliary dilatation. What is the diagnosis? That would be ascending cholangitis. What is the clinical definition of ascending cholangitis? It's an ascending infection of biliary tree in the setting of biliary obstruction or stasis. What is the pathogenesis of ascending cholangitis? That would be an obstruction in the biliary tree leads to stasis and bacterial overgrowth in the bile ducts, which are typically sterile. Infectious agents are often gram-negative rods, anaerococcus, or anaerobes. Risk factors for ascending cholangitis would be gallstones, female gender, age, and obesity. And what is the classic presentation of ascending cholangitis? Hint, it's a triad. That would be Charcot's triad, which comprises of fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. So remember those three. If you see those clinical signs, think ascending cholangitis. If the infection gets worse and the patient develops septic shock or sepsis-like picture, what other clinical signs does the patient develop? And remember, this would be a pentad called Reynolds pentad. So you would have the Charcot's triad plus altered mental status and septic shock to create that pentad. What lab studies would you find elevated in ascending cholangitis? So you would have an elevated white blood cell count. Your ALKFOS would be high. You can have increased total and increased direct bilirubin and mild increases in liver enzymes. And how would you diagnose ascending cholangitis? So in patients with Charcot's triad and abnormal liver tests, usually treatment would be proceed directly to endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, which is otherwise known as ERCP, to confirm the diagnosis and provide biliary drainage. In all other patients with suspected acute cholangitis, a trans-abdominal ultrasound, right upper quadrant ultrasound, is recommended to look for common bile duct dilation for stones. An abdominal CT is performed in patients with abdominal pain and in patients with suspected acute cholangitis who have a normal abdominal ultrasound. And if your ultrasound is normal and CT is normal, but you still have a high suspicion for acute cholangitis, you can go ahead and perform a magnetic resonance cholangio pancreatography, which is otherwise known as MRCP. Any of the second-line imaging techniques would be recommended in patients where you suspect ascending cholangitis, but they may not necessarily fit the triad with fever, abdominal pain, jaundice, where they don't have all three, but your clinical suspicion is still high given the history, symptoms, lab findings, etc. Differential diagnosis for ascending cholangitis would be acute cholecystitis, biliary leak, acute pancreatitis, and a liver abscess, so keep that in the back of your mind. The diagnostic criteria for ascending cholangitis would be signs of systemic inflammation. So can you think of what those signs would be? Fever, elevated white blood cell count. Then secondly, they must have cholestasis, so some element of jaundice, increased alkphos, or bilirubin. Then imaging findings need to be present, such as biliary dilation and visualization of obstruction. What is the initial management approach for ascending cholangitis? So it's acutely managed with antibiotics and ERCP, but patients will eventually undergo cholecystectomy along with supportive care. 
Additionally, second line treatment would be percutaneous drainage. Indications would be failure of ERCP and inability to perform ERCP. A serious complication of ascending cholangitis would be a hepatic abscess and has a high mortality rate, so that's something that should be watched out for. All right, let's move on to our next vignette. So we have a 45-year-old female with a BMI of 30, presents with right upper quadrant pain for the last four hours. She reports in the past she has increasing transient right upper quadrant pain, especially after meals. On exam, she has tenderness to palpation in the right upper quadrant and a negative Murphy sign. Lab results shows an increased ALK FOSS and total bilirubin. A right upper quadrant ultrasound shows a dilated common bile duct. What is the diagnosis? So the diagnosis would be cholelithiasis. What is the clinical definition of cholelithiasis? That would be a gallstone obstructing the common bile duct. What is the pathogenesis? So you can have a gallstone in the common bile duct which causes increased obstruction leading to jaundice. Other complications could be acute pancreatitis and acute cholangitis. What are the clinical symptoms associated with cholelithiasis? So you might see a patient coming in with nausea, vomiting, fever, colicky right upper quadrant pain that's usually postprandial. What would you see on physical exam? Patient may have right upper quadrant tenderness on exam. On labs, what would you see on this patient? So they might have elevated ALK FOSS, elevated GGT, potentially elevated total and direct bilirubin, could have mild elevations in your AST, ALT. And what would you see on imaging? So usually first line would be right upper quadrant ultrasound for the initial study, but it's not as sensitive for cholelithiasis. It detects CBD, stones, in only 50% of the cases, so it cannot rule out this diagnosis if negative. If there's a strong clinical suspicion for cholelithiasis, but the right upper quadrant ultrasound is negative for any gallstones in the CBD, you can then proceed to MRCP, which is more specific for gallstone diseases in the common bile duct. And what would treatment be? So usually treatment would be ERCP with sphincterotomy and stone extraction with stent placement. It's pretty successful in about 90% of patients and helps relieve the obstruction of the common bile duct. Here's a quick pearl about CBD stones. So CBD stones, cholelithiasis, can be asymptomatic for years. However, the onset of symptoms in cholelithiasis can signal the development of life-threatening complications such as cholangitis and acute pancreatitis. So can you make a guess as to why acute pancreatitis might develop from CBD stones? So the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct converge at the ampulla of water in the duodenum. So a stone in the CBD can obstruct a flow out of the pancreatic duct leading to acute pancreatitis. So it's easy to confuse cholelithiasis and cholelithiasis. So let's review the differences between the two real quick. Cholelithiasis would be stone in the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis, stone in the common bile duct. Clinical features of cholelithiasis, remember, were, were asymptomatic or biliary colic versus cholelithiasis could be asymptomatic, right upper quadrant pain, epigastric pain, slash jaundice. Complications of cholelithiasis. Remember, where acute cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, if the stone goes from the gallbladder down to the CBD, gallstone ileus malignancy. Complications of cholelithiasis, where cholangitis, obstructive jaundice, acute pancreatitis. Okay, our next case is a 65 year old female with right upper quadrant pain has been having symptoms of an unintentional weight loss over the course of three months. Physical exam is notable for right upper quadrant tenderness to palpation. She's also noted to have scleral icterus, 
Abdominal ultrasound demonstrates an intraluminal mass obstructing the common bile duct and infiltrating the adjacent liver. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is carcinoma of the gallbladder. Most of the gallbladder carcinomas are adenocarcinomas and typically occur in the elderly. What are the risk factors of the disease? It's associated with gallstones in most cases. You could have chronic infections secondary to gallstones or porcelain gallbladder, which is intramural calcification of the gallbladder wall. What are the symptoms of gallbladder carcinoma? In early disease, it could be asymptomatic, so it has a lot of nonspecific symptoms, such as right upper quadrant pain, anorexia, nausea, vomiting. It can also cause obstructive jaundice. And how do you diagnose gallbladder carcinoma? Abdominal ultrasound is usually the indication. Findings on ultrasound will see mural thickening or calcification of the gallbladder wall. You might see intraluminal mass and direct liver infiltration. You can also use a cross-sectional CT or MRI, MRCP. It's usually the imaging of choice in patients with ultrasound findings concerning for gallbladder cancer or incidental diagnosed gallbladder cancer following cholecystectomy. Next vignette, we have a 72-year-old female with a past medical history of obesity and cholelithiasis presents with fatigue and right upper quadrant pain. On exam, she's notable for scleral icterus. Abdominal ultrasound demonstrates ductal dilation without clear cause. Cross-sexual MRI demonstrates a malignancy of the intrahepatic duct. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is cholangiocarcinoma. What is cholangiocarcinoma? It is a tumor of intra- or extrahepatic bile ducts. Most are adenocarcinomas, and the mean age of diagnosis is in the seventh decade. Prognosis is usually poor and less than a year of life after diagnosis. Risk factors for cholangiocarcinoma would be primary sclerosis and cholangitis is a major risk factor in the United States. Other factors would be UC, cholidocal cysts. Another rare cause would be a clinorchis sinensis infestation. What are the clinical features of cholangiocarcinoma? Would have obstructive jaundice with dark urine, clay-colored stools and pruritus, weight loss. Treatment of cholangiocarcinoma is geared towards the staging of the malignancy. You might use radiotherapy with chemotherapy. Patients may have ERCP to determine if the tumor is resectable. Stent placement during ERCP is an option and may relieve biliary obstruction. Let's talk about pancreatic pathologies. So we have a 53-year-old male with a past medical history of hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and alcohol abuse who presents with acute onset epigastric pain. His last drink was this morning and he drinks approximately 15 beers a day. He denies any fevers or chills, but reports nausea in two episodes of non-bloody, non-bilious vomiting. Physical exam is notable for tenderness to palpation in the epigastrum area. Lab results show significantly elevated amylase and lipase. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is acute pancreatitis. What is acute pancreatitis? It is the inflammation of the pancreas resulting from prematurely activated pancreatic digestive enzymes that invoke pancreatic tissue autodigestion. What are the risk factors for acute pancreatitis? Remember the mnemonic, I get smashed. I stands for idiopathic, G stands for gallstones, which is the most common cause, and it happens to form about 40-70% to 70 of pancreatitis cases. E stands for ethanol. Ethanol is the second most common cause of pancreatitis after gallstones. T stands for trauma. S stands for steroids. M stands for mumps. A stands for autoimmune. S stands for scorpion stings. H stands for hyperlipidemia, hypercalcemia. E stands for ERCP. D stands for drugs, such as thiazides, sulfa drugs, NRTIs, protease inhibitors, valproic acid. Those are drugs that can all cause pancreatitis. What are the clinical features of acute pancreatitis? Symptoms include abdominal pain, usually in the epigastric region. 
Pain may radiate to the back in approximately 50% of patients. Some of the clinical signs would be low-grade fever, tachycardia, hypotension, and leukocytosis. Epigastric tenderness, abdominal distension. You can have decreased or absent bowel sounds, which indicate partial ileus, and the following signs are seen with hemorrhagic pancreatitis as blood tracks along the fascial planes. So you can see gray turner sign, which is flank ecchymoses, colon sign, which is periumbilical, and the fox sign, which is ecchymosis of the inguinal ligament. Diagnosis of acute pancreatitis must fulfill two out of three criteria. Do you know what this criteria is? One, the classical clinical presentation, so epigastric pain. Two, lab findings, such as elevated lipase. And three, imaging findings, such as a CT scan of the abdomen that shows the classic pancreatitis findings. So you have to have two out of those three present. In terms of lab findings, you can see an elevated serum lipase and amylase. Lipase is more specific for acute pancreatitis. Your LFTs might be elevated, and that might indicate a gallstone pancreatitis. Additionally, you could see hyperglycemia, hypoxemia, and leukocytosis. Now, there's a certain criteria to determine the severity of pancreatitis and the mortality from acute pancreatitis. Do you know the name of the criteria? It's called Ranson's criteria. So on admission, labs to get would be glucose, LDH, AST, white blood cell count, along with your amylase lipase. So if your glucose is greater than 200, your age is greater than 55, your LDH is greater than 350, your AST is greater than 250, and your white blood cell count is greater than 16,000, those are all admission criteria for severe pancreatitis. You must have three of those that are elevated to meet the severe pancreatitis criteria, and those who have severe pancreatitis are often admitted to the ICU for management. Now, additionally, with the criteria, you look at the initial 48-hour criteria to help determine the mortality of the patient with acute pancreatitis. So if their calcium is less than 8, they have a decrease in hematocrit greater than 10%, their PaO2 is less than 60, there's a BUN increase greater than 5, their base deficit is greater than 4, or their fluid needs are greater than 6 liters within 48 hours, then based on the number of these criteria that they have, that correlates with the increased chance of mortality. Imaging for acute pancreatitis can be done with an abdominal ultrasound or CT scan of the abdomen. So let's talk about complications of acute pancreatitis. Can you think of any complications? So you could have pancreatic necrosis. There's both the sterile infected types. The only way to distinguish sterile from infected necrosis is via CT guided percutaneous aspiration with gram stain culture of the aspirate. Another complication is pancreatic pseudocyst. It's an encapsulated fluid collection that appears two to three weeks after an acute attack. Unlike a true cyst, it lacks an epithelial lining. And diagnosis of the pseudocyst is with CT scan. Cysts less than five centimeters require observation. Cysts greater than five centimeters, either drained percutaneously or surgically. Another complication is hemorrhagic pancreatitis characterized by the colon, gray turner, and Fox sign. CT scan with IV contrast is the study of choice. Additionally, ARDS, adult respiratory distress syndrome, is a life-threatening complication with a high mortality rate of pancreatitis. Patients can also have pancreatic ascites and pleural fusion. The most common cause is inflammation of the peritoneal surfaces. Additionally, ascending cholangitis can be a cause due to gallstones in the ampulla of water, leading to infection of the biliary tract. And then lastly, patients can get pancreatic abscess, which develops over four to six weeks and is less life-threatening than infected pancreatic necrosis. How do you treat acute pancreatitis? Management approach is remove all offending agents when possible. First line is supportive care, so you have fluid resuscitation, electrolyte repletion, pain control, 
bowel risks, so make them NPO, but feed as soon as tolerated. You can use an NG decompression, so you can put in an NG tube to decompress the bowels. And then other treatments are ERCP with eventual cholecystectomy if you're suspecting gallstone pancreatitis. Next, let's talk about chronic pancreatitis. What's the definition? It's persistent or continuous inflammation of the pancreas with fibrotic tissue replacing the normal pancreatic tissue. The endocrine and exocrine functions of the pancreas are impaired, and that leads to malabsorption, leading to fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, K deficiencies, and diabetes due to the pancreas's inability to produce insulin. What are the clinical features of chronic pancreatitis? So you have severe pain in the epigastric area with recurrent or persistent abdominal pain, often accompanied by nausea or vomiting, may be aggravated by an episode of binge drinking or eating, radiates to the back in about 50% of the cases. Additionally, other symptoms would be weight loss due to malabsorption, alcohol abuse, diabetes, steatorrhea secondary to malabsorption, so you might see those oily, greasy stools. In terms of imaging, on CT scans, seeing calcifications around the pancreas can indicate chronic pancreatitis. In terms of treatment, let's talk about the non-operative management. So you want to replace the pancreatic enzymes. So that's replacement therapy. Narcotics for pain control might give insulin due to severe pancreatic endocrine insufficiency. Frequent, small-volume, low-fat meals may improve abdominal pain. Finally, let's talk about pancreatic cancer. It is the most common in elderly patients. 75% of the patients are greater than 60 years old. It's rare before the age of 40, and it's most common in African Americans. Anatomic location would be the pancreatic head present in 75% of the cases, pancreatic body in 20% of the cases, and pancreatic tail in 5-10% to of cases. Risk factors include cigarette smoking, that's the most clearly established risk, chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, heavy alcohol use. The prognosis is dismal. Most patients die within months of diagnosis. In terms of clinical features, abdominal pain, 90% of patients might have vague and dull pain. They have jaundice, most common with the carcinoma of the head of the pancreas. Less than 10% of patients with cancer involving the body or tail of the pancreas have jaundice. It indicates obstruction of the intrapancreatic CBD, and it's a sign of advanced disease if you have um, jaundice present. Additionally, weight loss is common. You can have recent onset of glucose intolerance depression, weakness, migratory thrombophlebitis develops in about 10% of the cases. Another clinical sign is Corsier's sign. It's a palpable gallbladder without pain. It's present in about 30% of patients with cancer involving the head of the pancreas. So diagnosis... ERCP is the most sensitive test for diagnosing pancreatic cancer. You can also use CT scan, which is the preferred test for diagnosis and assessment of the disease spread. Additionally, tumor markers such as CA199 has sensitivity of 83% and specificity of 82%. Also, CEA tumor marker has a sensitivity of 56% and a specificity of 75%. In terms of treatment for pancreatic cancer, surgical resection is most commonly used, known as the Whipple procedure, is the only hope for cure. However, only a minority of tumors are resectable, roughly about 10%. The prognosis is very poor even after resection. If the tumor is unresectable and biliary obstruction is present, you can do ERCP with stent placement across the obstruction for palliative care. Thanks for sticking with me till the end of this podcast. I hope you have a better understanding of biliary and pancreatic diseases now. 
Thank you for listening. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe to our podcast. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, visit our website at spoonfulofsugar.org and post them under the link for this episode. Good luck with studying and remember that if you ever have an SOS moment while studying, Spoonful of Sugar is always here to help the medicine go down. Thank you.